welcome everybody. I'm sorry we're a little late, but hopefully worth waiting for. <laughs> Uh, my name is Karen Anderson, I'm the current president of the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland and it's my pleasure to welcome you today to this Festival of Politics event. It's uh, all the more apposite because the festival is 20 years old and we are discussing the Parliament 20 years on. And of course that building, this building, is you know, at the heart of Scottish politics. Um, Today, we're, we're very fortunate. We have an excellent panel, all of whom have played a part or have very strong feelings <laughs> about the Scottish Parliament. Um, and I'd just like to, from my left, Scott uh, Tavish, uh, Gordon McGregor, Benedetta Taibui, and Rory Moyer. I'll give you more details about them later. Um, but basically, today's event is going to be recorded and it's going to be on the YouTube channel of the Parliament. During the event, if you wish, the social media channels I'm told are for Instagram it's it's Scott Parl, at Scott Parl, quite difficult. And if you do tweet and you're still on X, eh, it's <laughs> it's visit Scott Parl at visit Scott Parl. So please if if you want to do so. Um, we'll have an, an opportunity to ask uh, some questions later. Um, and I'm just going to mention this now because I'm guaranteed to forget it at the end when I'm all excited. <laughs> um, there is a survey which those of you who had got involved with the Eventbrite tickets should be able to fill in. And again, I'm told there's some hard copies at the back. So if you were able to just give some feedback, that's always incredibly useful. So. Um, just to go and some more details of our guests. First of all, I'm absolutely delighted to, to welcome Benedetta Talia Bui. I, I hope most of you in the room will not need an introduction because Benedetta is um, awarded and lauded throughout, throughout the world. Benedetta was the um, partner and founding partner of EMBT with her late husband, Enrique Morales and since his passing has gone on to establish the Fundacio EF for Enrique Morales. Her work's been recognised throughout the world, and she, uh, in, in the UK, she's the recipient of the RIBA gold medal, um, and she's also uh, built the practice from, from Enrique's passing. She now has offices in Paris and in um, Shanghai, as well as Barcelona, where the practice was founded, and she's working throughout the, 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 the globe on projects in, in public realm. I think I noticed you're even working on design of lighting. I saw an amazing light for Artemides um, based on Jupiter's moon. So all sorts of, from big buildings to beautiful objects. Welcome. Um, on uh, 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 Benedetta's left is Gordon McGregor. Uh, Gordon is a Scottish architect with over 35 years experience and he tells me he's worked in more practices than uh, he cares to mention but amongst them are um, Nord, some of the most interesting practices in Scotland, Nord and Grass and Rural Design and Bard, we'll go on to that later, uh, but importantly for today he worked in RNGM who were the executive architects um, and engineers for delivering um, this beautiful building. Um, moving on, further to the left is Scott Tavish. No, Tavish Scott. So, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you, yeah, I thought I got it. <laughs> apologies. Uh, I think there's a, uh, Tavish Scott, great apologies. Uh, Tavish is actually, um, previously, you were the chief exec of, is it, uh, this I'll get it wrong, Salmon Scotland, Scotland, <laughs> Salmon Scotland and also uh, involved in the external affairs of Scottish rugby, which are both cultural icons, as much as this is for our, for, for our, 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 our Scottish identity. He's currently on um, Places for People as a non-executive board member, which is again very opposite in the, the housing emergency. Um, and he's, uh, um, he was cl uh, critically involved in the parliament as part of what was called the Holyrood, Holyrood Progress Group. They were tasked with reporting to the Parliament and ministers on the progress of the building. And you worked alongside Linda Fabiani and Lewis MacDonald. So 
lots of insights we will have <laughs> today from that. Last but not least, um, Rory Moore, who is the founding um, director of architectural practice BARD. And Rory um, is the next generation of Scottish architects, but his connection is, um, I'm told that you're one of the experts on this building. And uh, this stems from your, your passion originally from Macintosh, but that led you to um, EMBT and Enrique Morales, where you studied and also worked in Barcelona. So we have a, 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 a good range of contributions to our talk. Um, as I said, there'll be opportunities um, to, to ask questions, but I thought I would maybe first kick off with a general question, but first to Rory about what inspires you about this building, either the project, the building, or its legacy? Well, uh, <clears throat> it's hard to sum that up without taking up all the time, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> because there's so many avenues and, and aspects that you might want to select. but. Uh, in, in a way, it's a building or a project or a collection of buildings that embody so many different things. Um, first of all, from, from its stature in Scotland and as being our national parliament. Um, second of all, with being the um, incredible project of one of the most amazing architects and architects in, uh, in the 20th century. Um, and then it's got the light around every corner. Mm -hmm. In a way, I think that this building embodies a lot of my favourite aspects of architecture, what I think true architecture maybe really is, mm -hmm. and that's a symbolic nature, meaning um, being able to um, embody so many different things. And I think this building does that so well in a way that very few buildings ever come anywhere near. And I think that's why it's, uh, from the first time I saw it, I think in 2005, yeah. um, my dad took me here. <laughs> so I took photographs with the film camera. Uh, that it was crooked in the same way that looking around a Macintosh building like the School of Art was the same sort of feeling. Uh, visceral. So visceral, <laughs> yes, that's a very good way to put it. It's it like an epiphany. It gets, it gets you, and it gets onto your skin, and 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 that's the thing. I was saying that in a way, I think that this building is a bit like a, a fine whiskey. Yeah. I think I was saying that last night over <laughs> a fine whiskey. <laughs> but there was a, but uh, that there's multiple ingredients, and different people can taste different notes, different things. So I don't know if that answers the question, but it's It's also a malt complex malt. process to get to whiskey yeah. <laughs> and the best malts. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe Tavish, you would well, like to... Whiskey, there's so many different whiskeys in here over the, uh, over the years. Um, uh, I think my direct answer, Karen, to your question is uh, the bravery of Donald Dewar at the outset. Uh, there's not much bravery in politics today. Uh, can you imagine this building being built today? I'm not sure Scotland's quite got it in it, in the way in which Donald had that vision right at the time. I see one or two people at the back here who reported on that, uh, 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 reported on, on that day. But uh, my starting point for this building was Donald, the late Donald Dewar, having the, having the utter bravery to take on the controversy of building a new building. Now, there was a heap of that, as we were reflecting earlier on. But it needed someone right at the top to say, we are going to do this. We're going to make the judgment over uh, an architectural practice and an architectural consortium to pull it together and to make it happen. And for that, he should always be remembered uh, for lots of other reasons. Donald was a great man, a great Scot, a great politician, great UK politician as well. But above all, in terms of the context of this building, it would not have happened had not Donald said, we are going to build this. And it's vital that, the, that they had that champion it in this project, but ultimately you must have become a bit of a champion for it, or were you just... <laughs> I think uh, you, you very kindly mentioned Lewis and Linda, Lewis MacDonald and Linda Fabiani and I in your introductions, Karen. We absolutely were champions for it. We wouldn't have done this had we not been. And actually, the majority of parliamentarians of the day very much were champions. The irony I find in politics is that all those people who opposed it at the time are now great champions of it. Um, uh, but maybe that's how these things go. I'm sure, Manizetta, you'd reflect on that too. But uh, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I absolutely believed in it at the time. And, and it was very exciting to be part of of uh, a lot of discussions, some of which I frankly didn't understand because you were way over my head on <laughs> detail. Um, but uh, the point was we were there, as you rightly said, to go back up the road because we were up in the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland at the time. 
um, and say to the say to our colleagues across party, um, look, this is uh, this is honestly the right thing to do. Um, yep, you're just going to have to hold your nerve on this. Politicians don't hold their nerves very well when things get tough, um, uh, but it's the right thing to do. And we're going to do it. So, in, in in terms of the whole process, I mean, it was really remarkable the way the building was generated, the competition, how it was briefed, Donald Dewar's ambition for something that was really uh, worthy of the people of Scotland at this vital time in their political lives. I just wonder, uh, Benedetta, if you maybe want to talk about how that made you, made you feel and the, t the studio feel and how you came to Scotland and, and that mission, shall we call it that, as an architect. Well, let's say one of the inspiration now, if we would go on with the inspiration, is the fact that I see the building present and working. Yeah. This is incredible, no? This is a miracle. We went uh, through the process and we realized many times that it was a process going on the, how do you say, on the knife, on the line of a knife, no? Because many times, you know, at the beginning it was a competition, idea competition. So we participated in it because we had a great love for Scotland. We were always going to the Glasgow School of Art because we loved Macintosh. We loved the people in the Macintosh School. We had a lot of friends and we loved Scotland. And then uh, they told us there is a fantastic competition, do it. So it was a competition that we did because we wanted to, to give something back to Scotland. As architects, we wanted to make a project which had to do with a place that we loved so much and we hoped that we could contribute to it. But then, you know, many times we do project competitions and then they never come to reality. And this seemed to be one uh, big possibility of not arriving to reality because there was so many controversies, so many difficulties. So it arrived to reality. It's a fantastic building. Now it works. Uh, it's hosting not only a politic life, but also civic life. This is uh, fantastic for me. Uh, whenever I come here and I see that, I go away happier. <laughs> <laughs> and it is inspiring, I would, I would say, given what you, you just talked about, the tentativeness of whether we can deliver on a vision which so often happens, you have the vision and the, you know, there isn't the follow through, you know, that actually means you get what, what you hope for in architectural terms out of a competition. It's rare. It's very rare. Yeah. Now we did a competition in uh, Shenzhen, a big one, fantastic uh, uh, conservatory. Now they are building something which is not what we wanted, you know. It's uh, very difficult to, to have uh, to be able to follow on an idea which remains uh, uh, true to, to its origin. Yeah. Uh, so th this happened here. Yeah. And uh, thanks also to the commission that were created, the progress group. Uh, the we had many problems, many interruptions, but at the end, oh, everybody started to have the same vision, which was so important to arrive to a fantastic, uh, good finishing. <laughs> That's an important and time to bring in, in Gordon, <laughs> because some of you may know that Gordon was in charge of package superstructure East. 605. Yes. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, that is the, the debating chamber and its roof, which was arguably the, the most important part of the building. And, and you were charged with being the deliverer of the architectural vision in Scotland, in line with obviously working with the MBT. So was that inspiring to work with that practice? Oh, yes. I, I had uh, always been a fan of Enrique's. Oh. I had actually gone to Barcelona in 84 with Alan Thornton. And we, we looked at the square in front of the railway station. And it was amazing. And then I saw Enrique talk at the Macintosh and he was very inspiring. So when the competition came along, I jumped at the chance to come and work for him. Um, and that's, the competition is also something you should talk about. Um, 
the other entrance created a building, a kind of for, you know, a fossilised solution for the building. And you talked about ideas for the building, and I, I think that captivated Donald Ewell. And I think Andy McMillan, who was chair of the the jury, also saw that. And I think it was a clear winner at the time. So I, I, I came down, and we, we had a big team at Romjo. So there was probably over 100 over the period of the job, um, all working on different bits of the job. Um, but the bit I was working on was mainly this east superstructure, the concrete of the towers and the chamber and the chamber roof. And then we added bits to that package as we went along, the boundary walls. So it was um, intense six years of work. Intense dedication and cooperation. You know, everybody, I think, probably found it, you know, a challenge to be involved for such a long period. But then the point you made, Benedetta, was it was relatively quick as a project on site, or from conception to site. I think it is. No, we were supposed to perform all this uh, project and construction in three years. I think this is yeah. absolutely impossible. I think, <laughs> I, think, I think it was impossible. <laughs> Both of us used to do these programs, and you'd get to Christmas and you'd say, oh, we've only got another year to go in this. <laughs> and then next Christmas you'd get there, oh, another year. <laughs> but the reality is it's a huge complicated build. I think we produced 15,000 drawings or something like that um, in RMJ alone uh, and thousands of instructions and changes and things that happened during the process. Um, the doubling of the area of the building was crucial. Right? That virtually meant a redesign that took a year. Um, so it was hugely complicated. But I think you're right, six years probably is the right amount of time to do that. It's less than that. Mm. Because the competition was in the middle of, uh, of uh, 1998, mm. and it was an idea competition. And on top, there was no client, actually. Yeah. So no program. Yeah. <laughs> it was a oh, confusing program. I said, can you be more specific? No, 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 no. And, but of course, because, because uh, if you don't have a real body of a parliament, how can you explain how the parliament can work? You can have mm, vague ideas, but then the idea started to become more clear when the, uh, the actual parliament started to exist, and they started to say, oh, well, actually, we need a place for the press. Did anybody consider a place for the press? No, 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 no. Actually, we need a place uh, to meet uh, everybody. And, and then, I, I mean, the, the, the program started to get defined, and of course, the square meters started to double. Because, but this is, I mean, it's a quite logic, you know? But it was also very brave, I think, on Donald Dewar's side to say, okay, let's go into the process. Maybe we will find a lot of surprises because we don't really have the parliament yet. Uh, we will have to learn about how we will function in the process, but it's worthwhile to do it. So I, I, I have a great admiration towards Donald Jur, and, uh, and I remember very fondly the beginning of the, of the competition and I remember the day I had to, we had to present at the first competition, which was a kind of a only presentation of 20 firms. I was in Barcelona and Eric was coming from Harvard. So we were supposed to meet in, in London. And uh, I went to, to the airport without passport because there was this open uh, uh, European uh, borders. And I, I think back and I think it was crazy. And I went to the, to the airport and she said, do you have the passport? Oh, no. I said, yeah, you're going to, to London, you need a passport. Oh, I thought I didn't need a passport. Okay, if you're going for the day, I give you a pass. Yeah. 
which is something that I look back, I think it was a miracle. <laughs> but it was, <laughs> it was a symbol of what had to happen. <laughs> but Benedetta makes a great point about the debating chamber because your point about the different clients from the government to civil servants to, to members of the Scottish Parliament first elected in 1999, they all had a view. And uh, I remember that de first discussion when you and Enrique came up to pitch the shape of the debating chamber. And of course, politics in this country dominated by two sword lengths, House of Commons, Westminster, not the European model you're familiar with in, in, in uh, Madrid or in the autonomous regions of Spain. And we, most of us had to think a bit about that. Uh, what would that shape be? And you've made a very, very impressive, persuasive case for a certain semicircular shape, yeah. but that took endless discussion, as far as I can remember, about bananas versus, <laughs> you know, and this is European bananas, remember, they're all meant to be straight and all that stuff. <laughs> so, so there was lots of discussion in that, in that kind of sense. But your, your fundamental point, Bennett, is really important that actually uh, it wasn't easy at all for either Gordon or in his wider practice or for your international practice, because the client was changing his or her mind. Uh, repeatedly through the beginning and those early days. We didn't necessarily know what we wanted, you know? Exactly. It, so it was, it was complex. And the point also about press is really important. They had completely forgotten about the press. Well, what do politicians want? Access to the press. And yet, when the first designs we saw as members came up, there was, they, were, they simply weren't included. And self-evidently, that wasn't a very good pitch, if you think about who's writing stories about the building. <laughs> so there were a few things like that that had to happen quite quickly. It's almost a story of a moment in time, which actually, in many ways, I was reflecting. It was almost like conceiving of a cathedral. Mm. Or, you know, in, in essence, it's, you know, it's, it, has a, it has a life of its own as it grows. Or, mind you, I think early Christians would have a clearer idea of what they wanted in a cathedral. But it's this idea that you know, it's, it's, it's a work of art and collaboration rather than what we are now presented with is a very hard brief that tells us exactly how many square metres for the press. So, you know, it's a, it's a lovely story of how collaboration can make something unique and meaningful. And I think that's what's so special about this building. It's the, as you say, the bravery that was involved. There must have been some low points. <laughs> Sorry, Rory, I'll come to you. There must have been some low points in this project. And I just wonder, without depressing us in these depressing days. <laughs> what were the low points for you, maybe? Or were there any? It was very complicated, I have to say. First of all, we were coming from outside. Uh, our language, our knowledge of the place was not perfect at all. And we tried our best to understand and to be understood. And um, But I think we found uh, a, a subject, a, a parliament, which had a sort of a, a very complicated past. You know? In a way, uh, I went into the old parliament building that now is used by the judges, and, and the, the story that a parliament nearly happened uh, 300 years before, and, and then it didn't happen. And uh, so and all the story was coming from very, very, very long before. And, and there were many, uh, like you know, like a river with a lot of water, and and you're really struggling because you have currents from every side. So we had that. We had that at the beginning. Uh, we were surprised, and uh, Rick was laughing to find all these terrible articles on uh, on the newspapers. We were going there like you know with a open heart, uh, giving a present, and pff, we were receiving uh, terrible articles or terrible little sketches. At the beginning, Eric was laughing and was cutting them and putting them in the notebooks. And then he started to not look at them because they are hurting. Yes. You know? So many of these things happened during the process. But I was always trying to understand that this was I'm in the middle of a river with a lot of currents, and uh, yeah. let's try to resist because we have a good message to give. <laughs> Very brief. It's interesting also to reflect that perhaps even being from out with Scotland made it easier to deal with the currents. I mean, if you've been building in Catalonia, would it have been 
I don't know. Also in Catalonia, we have a lot of currents, <laughs> but <laughs> would you, as, a, as a <laughs> in Barcelona, <laughs> find them more more sort of worrying? Or uh, I, maybe we speak the language better, <laughs> or maybe we know more the yeah. situation, the society. But uh, I think this project was also very important. So it made. Uh, you know, there, a lot of things were moving for everybody. So everybody was participating to this process. This made uh, the, the, the building more difficult. We also had to go through an inquiry, you know, to go in front of a judge, you know, as if we were guilty instead of, uh, of being good professionals. We were um, guilty people. So th this was not easy, and we had to to explain all the time and to believe our explanation and uh, also try to explain to politicians who were there uh, looking at architecture for the first time <laughs> and try to make them become our client and it was it was uh, complicated mm -hmm. but looking at the building I think it was really worthwhile mm -hmm. I think it's worth the paper. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe that <laughs> oh, no, uh, If it's okay to remark yeah, on some of the some of the points, because I think that it's really interesting to hear Tavish uh, with your reflections. I think on the the client's role in this project in terms of all the changes, and, and it was a necessary uh, perception. I, I was I was very young at the time. I wasn't practicing <laughs> at all, but um, but I remember it in the press, and I remember it just the the story of this. This there was almost every single day or every single week all the time on the news. But when I've been researching the, the process as well, trying to get under the skin of as much as I possibly can, uh, there are a lot of the, uh, the, the analysis all the time always seem to n take the heat off the client in some way, uh, in terms of that or the, the building's going over budget. And you were very excellent yesterday to say there was no defined budget, <laughs> so how can it be over? Um, and then uh, the time going over, and but all these necessity, the necessary design revisions and changes as you worked it out together was uh, so fundamental. So it's interesting to hear that now, um, or, or, or more recognized. And it's like that, that Dennis Lasden uh, quote, he says, clients get the buildings they deserve. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then on the reflection of the point of when uh, Enrique and Benedetta are doing this work here as well, coming to Scotland, and, and I think actually having that outside perspective. So uh, in a way, I think you saw Scotland in a way that we didn't see ourselves, and that's reflected in the outcome. But the fact of, again, through all this research of the process as well, the horrific nature of the press at the time um, was really unfair, uh, completely unfair. And I think that it's um, it's amazing that you're still uh, you're happy about it now, not not that going because through I that don't pain. Read but very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but, but it's uh, but you think of the result of this now and thankfully I think and it's taken twenty years, but thankfully we're starting to forget the political game. I think I, I would say maybe it was yeah, political. I think the important point Rory made there mm. is, is I don't blame the press. Mm. If the press are only as good as the information they're given, yeah. you're building a you're you you are constructing a, a very exciting modern uh, interpretation of both art and architecture and, and Scotland into this. But you were doing that in the context of having to be transparent about numbers and about figures and about everything else in a way which no other public building was subjected to, uh, and the client being politicians, half of whom were very happy to feed the press information and half of whom were embarrassed by that. So it was a perfect storm in that sense. And I suppose time does, time does heal and time moves on, hence my point about people who were against it at the time now love coming in here, and frankly, some are still members, and I can look them in the eye and say that to them. But, uh, um, but I, think, I think the important thing there is, um, quite understandably, what, what was challenging for politicians at the time was that the parliament of Donald Dewar's creation, and I mean the institution, what we were meant to be doing in here was about schools and education and ferries. You say about budgets, try ferries on the Clyde these days, you know. So I, I do think the I do think the wider interpretation of 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 why it was difficult at the time and and the, the people on this panel really had to deal with that was because. Um, for many of us, the attention was taken away from what we were meant to be doing in terms of a parliamentary committee perusing league tables on school performance as opposed to the latest front page of the daily record. And that front page of the daily record happened because someone, an opponent of the project, briefed the paper. That's just the nature of politics and the nature of press activity. I, I think we, we found 
that kind of bound our team together in Edinburgh. The attack, the con the constant attack. Um, you would get in a taxi to go down to site, and the taxi driver would be yes. talking about. It. <laughs> and then the inquiry was an incredible thing because you know doing a building is a really hard thing at the best of times. Suddenly, I was dragged back from site from here when we were trying to finish the building, yeah. and I had to do research back through TP two six zero five emails to feed. Brian Stewart to go in, the, in front of that uh, inquiry. And that was really difficult. Mm. You know. It was crazy. Uh, yeah, it was yeah. crazy. It was crazy. In, in many ways, we <coughs> haven't really lauded the building enough in that context. You know, time has diluted that particular toxic position, but we haven't actually really got it captured. And I, I think it was quite interesting. There was a discussion last night about... Um, some of there had been some of the letters and I think you know the history of the building is there but it's not properly been published so maybe we should be exactly 25 years birthday present for the 21 is great coming of age yeah 21 from opening okay okay more dancing Benedetta <laughs> I'd love yes. to celebrate with them. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we've kind of we've we've touched uh, on on a key aspect of of its the building's ambition um, and Donald Dewar's desire for it to actually meet the aspiration of the of the of the of the Scottish public. Just to maybe synthesise that a little more. In what ways? Does it deliver that? I'm assuming that you, you would agree that it does. You know, maybe um, Pavish, what you... Donald Dewar's vision. Um, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, if you remember Donald Dewar's uh, first speech from the opening up the hill in the, in the General Assembly rooms, um, Donald made a great speech which linked um, everything from, this, from building ships on the Clyde to the speak of the Mearns, as he described it. Uh, in other words, agricultural production in, in the rich uh, parts of east, uh, eastern Scotland. Uh, to many wild aspects of the highlands and islands where I come from, um, and I, that for me was what it was about. Uh, you know, this this place can be a reawakening of both Scottish culture and Scottish arts and Scottish architecture, uh, young practices and, and older ones, um, and th and that I think has got a bit lost over the piece. Now that's for the next generation of politicians to, to take forward, and I think what Donald set out at that time was, you know, the people in this place. Uh, can make that. You build a building, wonderful as it is, but actually it is those 129 members who you put in here who are the people who've got to make that difference. And he was very alive to that. You know, he was very alive. Because if you, one or two people in here as well who remember, the uh, Donald was very hot on the candidates his own political party put forward to be members of this parliament, you know. And I hope in the coming years that, you know, all the parties uh, embrace what's now kind of forgotten but it was, we want the best of Scotland in here, the best people in here, who can then do something with this wonderful building. Yeah. And the building itself, um, how does it actually, do you think, how, how does it contribute to the political pr um, practice and to our outreach as well? Obviously, it's, it's evident in, in all the events that happen here, but I just wondered the politicians themselves. Well, I'm five years out of date, because I've, uh, I've yeah. not been a member for five years, but... but um, I, uh, any building, any parliament, any structure is only as good as the time it's in. So, uh, you know, we, we've been through quite a divisive time in Scottish politics in the last 10, 15 years. Um, and I hope that'll move forward again and a new generation of younger politicians will come in and change that for the, uh, for the, for the future. Does the building help? Um, absolutely. The wonderful areas of, the, of the, uh, the garden lobby are all about people mixing, politicians mixing. Um, uh, the, the committee is, for me, still the most astonishing part of the building, the, particularly the committee room up on the top floor, which my, always was my favourite. When I chaired a committee, I just, and some of the clerks are probably in here, I just refused to be in any other committee room. So it's, <laughs> just, I'm not having it. That's where it's going to be. But the, um, uh, uh, and, then the, and then the sheer power of the debating chamber, I don't think anyone who walks in there for the first time can't go, wow. And I think for many of us who were lucky enough to be in on that first day when we debated in there, it was just, my goodness me, if you can't perform in here, then you shouldn't be in this game. So next generation need to grasp that. Yes, does this building help? Absolutely. It's a privilege to be in here, whether you just whether you work here or whether you're a member. 
I sat for the first time last last night in, in the debating chamber and it's it's such an uplifting space it's it's fascinating and I was reflecting on and I shouldn't but the Welsh um, assembly building and the difference and you, you made the point about I think it was you were talking about transparency and the obvious sense of transparency as opposed to the you know the deeper sense of what that might be in architectural terms as well as politics but I do think you know, that sort of one-hit wonder in Wales <laughs> doesn't give the depth of and the needs of the actual people who use that building. Anyway, sorry, don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, so I'll just say one really quick thing on that, yeah. uh, uh, Tavish's points here. I think, in a way, it may be the case for the politicians to rise to the architecture. Now, in this case, maybe. In, nowadays, this is the thing. And it's uh, on that point, so it's... Um, since the war there's probably been about 200 new countries created so they must have there must be a loads of new parliaments in it. I don't think there's a better one than this one I'm totally biased of course <laughs> but I think the complexity of it how it fits into the city and the landscape is unique you know? and, and when you walk through the building, every time you turn a corner, you see something that surprises you. It's not like a standard piece of architecture that, say, a London minimalist, that you know you're going to go into the next square box, and it's beautifully detailed. But every, everywhere you go in this building, turn a corner, and there's something that surprises you. And that's the amazing part about it, I think. Thanks for dropping that. <laughs> This is true. I mean, I no, but I think in a way the difficult story of the, of the beginning of this building made that the building was not praised enough mm. or not um, uh, published, for example. We don't have a book. But it was we drowned don't by all the, the sounds of the camera. You know, all, all the press were attacking it. So that it created a feeling in the country yeah. that you weren't to like this building, I think. Mm -hmm. that distance that we've got now, I think hopefully that's changed. I, I, I would like the, a book to happen <laughs> or more, uh, uh, more knowledge to, to happen about, uh, about the, the building itself, no? about its architecture. Yeah. Because I think now it's the time. Uh, now it's, uh, it's the time to, to really look at it without all the difficulties and the implication that uh, yeah. that made it become a kind of a difficult symbol. <laughs> I, I give a lecture in third year on political buildings. And I talk about um, other parliaments like Stormont, you know, that sits on a hill and is a staunch Protestant building, you know. And, and there's something that always, I always say there's something beautiful about walking downhill to the parliament. But I, I give this lecture to third years at Strathclyde, and none of them were around when all that controversy was around. So I have to explain that to them. <laughs> um, but, you know, th th that generation doesn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. hmm? yeah. They just see the building. Yeah. Yeah. And the building lasts forever, and the programme and the budget do not. <laughs> the building is the, you know, the legacy, and nobody ever talks about the programme after the building's finished. <laughs> I mean, I see on the point of a, of a book, which I think is, needs to happen as well, in a way, it's the story of the creation as well. So the outcome is one thing, which is obviously magnificent, and we're in it, and we're experiencing it. But some of the stories that you hear from, well, your team in Barcelona, from Gordy, and your, your colleagues as well here in Edinburgh, um, some of the politicians as well. I've only met Tavish today, <laughs> before that, Linda Fabiani. And the story of, I suppose, everyone so focused, aside from all that noise out there, but so focused on this vision and to achieve that vision for very particular aims. And I think that, that's a story that also needs to be told. Because um, it's, it's, it's Herculean scale as well from a construction point of view, mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, if you see the complexity of some of the elements of it. And just delivered it so beautifully and so incredibly, I think. In a way also so collectively, 
that she tells today was with my sister walking around. She said, oh, I cannot believe that you did that. I said, I didn't do that. <laughs> well, of course, you cannot do that alone. Uh, we had a fantastic team. Your team was incredible. We had a, a big team also in Barcelona. We, we had the strength from many uh, craftsmen and many also industries entering into the process. Uh, the management was also very powerful. I think it was a building with a collective, big collective effort. A lot of people working yeah. here. But you, you asked Karen about the low points. Yeah. So the low point for me was when Mick Duncan came into the office and said Enrique had died. So we all, I, I think all of us in Edinburgh were shocked. And um, I know that at that point I vowed that I would do the best job I could possibly do on the, on the project for Enrique. <laughs> and I think that was the whole team. Thought that, um, and I think you should. We should mention Joanne Carlis, who kind of took over when Enrique went and uh, did an amazing job to, to carry it, carry it forward and finish it off. Yeah, fantastic. And I, I remember the the night we won the Sterling Prize. Joanne came on the stage and he was crying, mm -hmm. and I, the pressure he must have been under, I think, was would be incredible. It was a big pressure. <laughs> yeah. well, there's, other, there's other people who haven't been lauded enough, and I think you've, we talked about Brian Stewart's role and also John Gibbons' role from, from, the, from the government side. And I, I think there's a story that has to come out. I mean, it's, it's a very uh, sort of wide story of, of how things happen, but I think it's fascinating. It's also uh, Benedetta as well. Yeah. Uh, stepping into those shoes at that time with this maelstrom, because it wasn't just the only project that you were delivering at the time either. Uh, you must have had Santa Caterina, Vigo, potentially, and others. And in the middle of the horrific thing that had happened as well, and then with all, the, as we've been talking about, the pressure, added pressure on this project to then take that forward was yeah. uh, quite, a, quite a feat, uh, quite an achievement. For sure. I, I try to forget. <laughs> but when you also, as a partner, a female partner, or you remain alone, you notice that uh, there is this kind of um, attitude of uh, you become very weak, and so everybody is becoming more aggressive towards you. So it was very complicated. I had to try to show that I also was very able to defend myself. It was not so easy. <laughs> very difficult indeed. Yeah, and we survived. Yes, and, it, that's a lot. and you thrive. I think that's the best of the yeah, best inspiring, of it. inspiring, I think. Oh, that's yeah. part of the inspir it's inspiration all around. I think I'd like, if, if it's um, OK now, to open um, the, the floor uh, to, for questioning. Um, and I believe there's roaming mics going around. So if anyone has a question, yes, please put up your hands and hopefully the mics will find you. There's someone in the front row down here. Thank you very much. That was very inspiring. I'm, um, I'll be very honest. I'm try I really am trying to love the building from the outside. Uh, in, in, on the inside, I think it's amazing. It's beautiful. It, it, I can respond to it immediately. Personally, I don't quite get it on the outside yet. Um, and uh, I bring a lot of people over from Asia to Scotland, and I try to explain it, and I do a very bad job of it. Um, how, how do I get to love the outside of this building? <laughs> because my, my, my question is really... It feels like in Scotland we've gone for haute couture, uh, you know, the very best, the best, best you can get, but you have to have a certain level of education and knowledge and sophistication to appreciate this building, which kind of goes against what we want to do in Scotland, which is not be elitist. Am I being overly negative with that? Said, are you an architect by background? Or no, I'm a publisher. Yes. I mean, again, 
I think Bernadetta might want to answer that, but I think there's an interesting, personally, there's a backstory that's all about the cultural resonance of the building, which to me is as important. You, you talked about Scottish, um, Scottish ambitions for the people, but it's, it's, it's actually investing that level of quality for people, but also the resonance of Scottish culture. So I, you probably will. <laughs> It is very difficult when someone says, how can I love a building you have designed? I don't know, I love it, but, <laughs> but I don't know. We, we tried to make a building which uh, is, uh, let's say, all Edinburgh is very ornate, is very beautiful, it's a lot of details, but you cannot mimic that in a contemporary building. Yeah. So in a way, maybe we applied to have many materials and a facade which is has a complexity and a, and a vibration. So we, we of course we were looking at the mountain next to us and try to, to, to get an inspiration. But at the end we, we, we tried to introduce facade which has um, cement or uh, concrete as a kind of a very strong material which becomes beautiful and it's next to stone, which is a stone coming from Scotland, which has a special quarry, and then uh, next to another stone, which was supposed to be basalt from, from, uh, from Scotland. Mm -hmm. Then at the end, it was not for a budget reason. But uh, um, uh, life is like that, no? <laughs> but I mean, it's, uh, it's also talking about another type of stone of Scotland, and then other materials on a different levels, which create shadows, which are made in in uh, in wood, wood from Scotland, which is oak, and I think all this vibration was supposed to introduce something similar, more or less, to what you see in nature, mm -hmm. where you find different layers of stones, uh, different layers of vegetation, different colors. So the facade is not a flat building; mm -hmm. it's not a, a kind of a a uh, postmodern imitation of something which already existed, but it's a new way to create a vib vibration on the exterior. But if you don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I like it a lot more now. Thank you. Thank you for the question. <laughs> I think this, yep. Yeah. If you could just, a little introduction, your brief, um, you know, your background just. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, um, I, I uh, currently uh, work for the Houses of Parliament down in London and I'm interested what advice you would give to anyone embarking on a project like this again. If Say, say you didn't have this building, what advice would you give the next, the next generation? Someone else would like to give <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a kind of semi quasi political answer. Um, I, I think you you definitely need someone to lead uh, in the in the if it's a public building to in the context of a parliament building. You definitely need someone to lead. Um, you definitely uh, need to do your best to nail down cross party support, self evidently, which is what we didn't have in in uh, ninety nine two thousand. Uh, and and also, and I take all the points about length of construction, that kind of thing, you need to remember the electoral cycle. Um, Gordon was very honest and, and, and I absolutely understand his perspective about what it was like running into 2003. If you were someone knocking on doors in the 2003 general election in Scotland, it wasn't a happy experience. <laughs> Believe me, and I won, you know, uh, and it was still not a happy experience, you know. So, so there's a, a if if your client base include and you and you may go through this with the House of Commons because if whatever you decide to do in the Commons in terms of full refurbishment or whatever's going to happen, leave that wonderful part, Gothic pile to be a museum and instead build something functional for members of Parliament, then whatever whatever happens down there. But I but I, I do think those things are really really important. But I won't ever go away from the fact that if it hadn't been for Donald Dewar saying we are just going to do this in the classic style Donald uh, articulated it at, at that moment, we, we wouldn't have, it wouldn't happen. Which is after all, as you know better than me, why it's, no one's yet made a decision about the House of Commons. It's still going on and on and on, costing millions to keep going, as you know, that work in it every day. So um, it needs that bravery right at the top of the ticket. I, I had the, the budget for 
repair in Westminster was like £6.4 billion. Pounds. So I would say, give us that budget and we would bring this building in under budget. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the nice things of uh, decisions of Donager was to interview architects. He made a list of the best architects in the world. Uh, he, he asked uh, uh, specialists and then he had a personal conversation and I think he was really looking for someone whose art was meeting with his own art as a politician, but he wanted a real artist architect. So in a way, I, I believe that we have to believe in architects as uh, people with a special knowledge, with special capacity. At the end, we are, we are very good in making buildings. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes uh, now the society forgets a little about architects. But I, I believe very much in our category. <laughs> and for the dedication that you have to give to a building, you need to have a trust and a relationship with your client. And yeah. back to your comment at the beginning, you get as a client what, yeah. And I think, I think that is lost in the procurement systems and public investment we don't have that, that, that connection because you have to give so much of yourself to make things happen. Yeah. Which is always measured in the wrong thing sometimes mm. too. Yeah. Um, I think another quote, Louis Kahn saying, uh, a building goes through three phases, the measurable, the unmeasurable, no, sorry, the unmeasurable, the measurable, and the unmeasurable again, if it's, if it's architecture. And this is the thing is that we're always concentrating on the measurable all the time, yeah. and we shouldn't be. Um, I just, it's just all This all is the festival of politics. We're yeah. allowed to make these yeah. <laughs> observations. It's not the festival of architecture, which we'll have next year when we celebrate the 21st. Some other questions. I think there's a few in this corner. Oh, I don't know. Could you maybe just start and, and work your way forward? There's um, a gentleman, I think it's Stuart, actually. Hello, Stuart. Hey, um, I work for Karen at the Royal Corporation of Architects, but I'm not an architect. I worked in politics in the beginning for Tavish, and I worked in the old building. Uh, I'd never I've visited this building, and I wonder, Tavish, from working in that building and then coming to this building, what's, what's the difference in this country? We tend to make do and mend, and that's what it was like up the hill, and it sort of worked. And then you came to this place, which was purpose-built, so how did that change things? It's a really good question. I think the one thing I missed coming down the hill was the interaction of just uh, the mill of Edinburgh, the or people milling around. Because when we were right up on the on the Royal Mile and George IV Bridge to walk from the office, and it was the old Lothian Regional Council offices, up to the debating chamber as a back door into the into the General Assembly, you had to walk through the mass of Italian tourists and Scottish school parties and you name it. And on days when something was going on, the press used to line up outside and give you, harangue you about whatever's going on. Believe me, we got it too. It wasn't just <laughs> architects. Um, and that's the one thing I miss because um, I think the, I, I understand why this site was chosen and it's, it's uh, in the context of being able to look out the window and look at an extinct volcano, it's utterly wonderful in terms of how the building is wedded to the land of, of Edinburgh. But the, the, from a political point of view, being in the middle of a city is really important. And that's the one thing I, uh, this site could never do because it's down here next to the Royal Palace. Um, that's one thing I, I probably missed at the time, that we had that wonderful interaction with just whatever was going on in the city. Um, and I think, uh, I remember, I'm trying to remember what the, Ian would remember at the back there, what the controversy was back in the early 2000s. But there was some controversy with lots and lots of protesters. Well, you, you get that now. It, I see it all. When I watch the telly now, I see it outside here. Up there, you were literally, you know, you're walking a gauntlet, you know. The, it was some days we had the police, the police in those days, it was the only Lothian and Borders police. Uh, uh, Chief Constable Strang coming in to say, I think we'll just be a little bit careful how we get you across the street this week because we're all getting a bit noisy outside and things like that. Well, it made you very alive to what was going on. So you couldn't even go and vote without being alive to what was happening. That was quite a good thing. That's the one thing I miss. Gentleman here, the red. I know. <laughs> Hi, uh, Daniel from uh, Utrecht, where City Hall was uh, constructed by uh, EMBT. 
uh, you mentioned working from an ID and um, then working with uh, changing client wishes uh, through the process. How did the process of uh, reconstructing the addition and the interior of Utrecht City Hall help um, with um, create a perspective on how a building could serve politics and civics just like this building? This uh, Utrecht City Hall was one of the first uh, competition we won uh, outside uh, outside uh, Spain. Well, actually, we, we had many other competitions, but this one arrived to, to, to be realized. And I remember it was, uh, it was uh, a committee coming from Utrecht coming to interview the architects who were in the short list of the competition. And they came to Barcelona and we told them, well, we have a very easy solution for your building. We will do a solution which is similar to our home. Then we invited them home and they looked at the house and they decided this was a very good idea. Actually, in our home, uh, we had this uh, experiment of working on an existing building and uh, accepting the building, but in the same time, making some changes in it, which also happens a little bit here in Queensbury House, but we were not very able to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and then in, in uh, Utrecht, we, we started with this idea. We realized it was not exactly like working on, in our home, <laughs> but I think it was, uh, it was a very, very special work, and uh, the result is not exactly what we wanted. Uh, many things were cut, you know, but anyway, it's, uh, the, the spirit of it is coming out very strongly. Do, do you like the building? <laughs> Myself, yes, but it's very controversial. Uh, but for me, it was a privilege working for city council and working in that building. But for many people, it's uh, not uh, at their taste. <laughs> okay, being controversial, maybe it's not so bad. <laughs> 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 I think it's also really relevant. We're talking about existing buildings and increasingly in the future, we will be using existing buildings and that needs creativity and it needs imagination and some, you know, sometimes bold, maybe sometimes quieter. But I think, you know, for our own human spirits, we need to be in, in, in not too precious. You were talking about Queensbury House, you know, the idea that one is too precious in conservation <laughs> rather than uplifting for the future, especially when it has to be for purpose. Yeah. So, um, yes, then Lynn. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Lynn Lenine. I'm Director of uh, Outreach and um, Operations at Architecture and Design Scotland. And um, we're currently running a value of uh, design campaign and just very interested on your reflections on what you would do differently in terms of user needs and you talked about the, the press was forgotten about or you didn't build space into the original building and some of the other requirements so it's how you balance user needs and design to try and make sure that there's collaboration and you incorporate your user needs into the design of the building. Well, in, uh, in a way, this, this of the users, yesterday we talked a little bit. It was at the beginning very clear that the parliament is extremely complicated in terms of fluxes of, of uh, public or politicians. So you have a very difficult system of security that we had to take into consideration since the beginning. And I think the building is kind of trying to make an entry, public entry, where you have the security. Not so terrible, no? We try to make it as, as little as possible. Then it had to be increased uh, afterwards. But um, the, the feeling has to be that it's not so complicated to enter the public part. And, and then the politician can enter in, a, in an easier way on another side so that they have their own security. But then inside the building is kind of creating a sort of a mix of these different uh, fluxes and, uh, and uh, things like today can happen so that uh, politicians can arrive in a room where the public can also arrive. So I think this uh, was very complicated to study and uh, we did very different versions. 
and at the end, I think it was quite satisfactory. So whenever I see the debating chamber with the public part and the politician part, or these uh, situations, or uh, the committee's room that Tavish was talking about, I think there is this uh, possibility of maintaining the security and mixing, which is one of the main points. You know, it's, a, it's a very great difficulty. So maybe Gordon can explain a little more about uh, that. Uh, well, this building is an amazing kind of work of art, but it's a building. It's not like a sculpture. So, so if you have a painting or a sculpture by a great artist, you, you, d you wouldn't touch it. But as you work through a building and the times change, you, then you have to adapt it. Um, the key to that is to adapt it correctly, I think. I think the changes that have been made in the building, the security entrance, um, the lights in the chamber, I don't think they're done sensitively enough. And I think that's a, a that's a key point. If it had been in my power to to do it, they would have went back to Benedetta, and she would have done that. Um, but there was a I, I'm sure there was a political reason why the architect was changed, or the designers <coughs> were changed. So w what happens with buildings is that there's a kind of architectural drift away from the original idea. And sometimes, um, I'm thinking of um, Louis Kahn's British Art Museum in, in Yale. It, it comes to a point where they actually go back to the original and then they, make, they redo the changes in a more sensitive way. So, I mean, maybe the building is not always easy to love on the outside. I don't know. I like it. But... but <laughs> But, but I'll take you around in a minute if you want. But uh, if that if that could if we could get to a point where the building is truly recognised for its its quality, then perhaps we can go back and change certain things again. I think we found our perfect publisher for that book that we were talking about. Because <laughs> if we can change you, <laughs> we can change the world. Yes. So. Factual, but I, I would have gone a lot stronger about <laughs> things, <laughs> the quality of those changes that have been made. You said you wouldn't. Yeah, exactly. And you got there first, <laughs> which I'm happy about. But in, in essence, I think it was the central thing about adaptability, but doing it correctly and right and sensitively. Um, then this building will be here for however many hundreds of years. Yeah. Um, but and next, next year, I believe the Parliament are going to do an exhibition on the building. And then in Rick's work, and I think that would be an amazing moment um, to see to see that uh, that uh, body of work in in context with his work, like Utrecht as well, and to see it all together. I think that would be brilliant, and and people will start to love it more. I think. I think I mean, it's, it's interesting your question because it's you know design meets the user's needs and art elevates it in architecture and I think you know that's what you see together in this building you know and your the complexity of the program is part of the design delight as well <laughs> yeah. certainly gentlemen down here how did we five more minutes yes <laughs> it's, it's coming away Maybe just for the people at the back, just thank you. Um, I uh, used to be an architect. I'm now a full-time academic teaching architecture. Um, and I've got a lot of history in teaching architecture that I'm getting old. <laughs> um, I, I, the building in a very short time has acquired a, a, a um, heritage. I know from friends who are indifferent at best to architecture, sometimes antagonistic. They've been blown away by how important the, the the shape and form of the committee rooms where they were being in, involved in progressing subjects like education. So there's this heritage already about how we think about space that's reached out beyond our profession. But a question about the heritage, I'd forgotten that there was an inquiry. And it's for the architects, my question is, 
What good did the inquiry do? It goes. It formed a doorstop, I think, ultimately. Mm -hmm. The public aid. It formed a doorstop. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it could hold a door open. The process that you underwent was obviously informed politically. And there's a certain level of vindictiveness sometimes in the way these inquiries are conducted. So I question, the question was, really, did the inquiry do any good? Did it serve any purpose in making this thing happen? You mean the inquiry? The left any heritage in how we might deal with I think from our point of view, there was no benefit from it. I think there was a lot of stress <laughs> involved in it. And I think that the process was at times very brutal. Some of the questioning of, um, was it Margaret Doig? Mm -hmm. was it? Uh, Barbara. But Barbara Doig um, was awful, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I suppose what it does is it tells government to be more careful. And I think that's the main thing. And, but maybe that's not a great thing. <laughs> you know, maybe they need to be bolder in supporting architecture um, and bigger ideas that we could bring to society um, than they are at the moment. Well, the inquiry was not uh, helping the architecture at all. What you were saying that we had to, in the middle of a very complex process, doing our best uh, to do an incredible Herculean job of trying to, to, to finish the building. We had to study thousands of documents to respond to questions like, uh, in uh, 1999, this letter was sent from uh, Gordon to, what have you to say about that? I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> no, we had to study things like that. You don't remember? Uh, yeah, I don't. I, I forgot everything now. <laughs> there, there, there was one thing on the on the inquiry. We got sight of their findings before uh, it was published, and one of, one of the criticisms that they wrote was that. Uh, the Barcelona team and the RMGM team didn't work well together. Right? And we, we looked at that in the office and everybody said that's ridiculous because it wasn't true. And we wrote a letter to Fraser and everybody signed it saying that we worked really well together. And they took that out of the inquiry, the findings. So. Yeah, I mean, inquiries are set up by politicians needing to scapegoat someone for a particular thing. I mean, look at what's happening with COVID at the moment. The COVID inquiries aren't going to report for years. The current politicians or the politicians who were in charge of public health policy at the time of COVID all will have left office. Complete waste of time. So your question is very fair. And it's not just about this one that affected this building and architecture as a practice. But, you know, next time you have a politician on your doorstep, you have a hard time about this one because it's, it's just a cop-out. You know, the, the, there was nothing that couldn't have been learnt about how things were done that couldn't have involved sensible, constructive meetings with the people on this panel who were involved at the time about lessons to be learned. Government should rightly learn lessons about things when they go way over budget, and it did, but that's because the client changed the, changed the, the footprint and so on and so forth. But, you know, I, I have, now I'm out. I have absolutely no time for it at all because they're just, <laughs> but at the time, difficult for a politician or a first minister to say no to an inquiry when when the budget started at 50 million and finished at 450. That's the politics of it. I mean, many of these, these are the things they can evaluate. This they cannot evaluate. <laughs> yeah. So a couple more questions. Jed, hello. In hearing these arguments, um, it reminds me of a saying, and it may be a throwaway one, and I'd like, I'd like the architect's view on this, that... Um, you, you need good clients for good architecture. And uh, do you think you defied that? <laughs> in, you mean in, uh, in, in this, case. this specific case? I, I mean, I'm 
understandably, I mean, buildings are complex, and uh, I'm an architect retired myself, and I know that um, the building itself is the tip of a, uh, an iceberg, and I don't think people appreciate the work and often hard take and so much of ourselves we give to that process. So. But I, I think in this case we had uh, a good client. I think we, we had a good client because the beginning of, of the parliament was a fantastic vision. And uh, the vision was strong and Donald Dior started this competition that I talked about, which was a long process going from 20 architects to 10 to five. And, and the conversation was personal because he was in the panel and there were five other people in the panel, experts and people who could also give good ideas to Donald, but Donald was very personally involved. And, and this meant that you had a real client with real ideas, and this was the, the beginning of the, of the process. So I remember, and I, maybe nobody recorded that, that at the beginning, Donald and Eric started to fight, <laughs> had a quarrel, because um, uh, Donald was really kind of asking Eric, uh, but how would you respond uh, to this uh, uh, question that I give you? And he said, well, I'm an architect and you're a politician. I respond in my way as you respond to politics in your way. And, and I, I thought, okay, bye-bye, this is sort of <laughs> finished. But no, uh, instead, uh, the, the relation became stronger. I think uh, Donald Dewar kind of appreciated more the strength of Eric, and at the end, uh, he chose him. But when he chose uh, him and us in, in, the, in, the, in the final the result of the competition, we also had a very clear vision that we knew we had to follow. This went on, and then Donald Dior died a few months after Enric, which was a really terrible. Mm. And then this committee had to learn how to become the embodiment of that vision. Mm. <laughs> so it was, a, <laughs> it, was a, it was a very interesting process, actually. It was interesting. Yeah, I, I, I think that progress was did an incredible job. I wasn't involved at that level, but there was a time when they brought in a project manager to really stamp down on the architects. And I remember going to a meeting and they wanted to put a column under Canningate Tower and, and all sorts of changes. And, and he went back to the progress group. Now, maybe I'm making this up, but they basically struck off all these ideas to change it. And, and he left, you know. So we, we so they support. That was, that was a high point. That was a high. <laughs> point. Yes, it was a very beautiful moment uh, where you had embraced the vision. <laughs> they supported ninety nine percent of of what we designed, which is kind of amazing, you know, given the controversy that, and the pressure that they were under from within the parliament and without the parliament to change and. You know, make cuts and things like that. Um, and we managed to build the building that we did. We were seeing beforehand, uh, we were speaking to Tavish about, because uh, I know more of the architects than the client side, really, but th with the architects knowing about this or feeling this kind of galvanization around the project to carry it through despite the taxi drivers and everyone giving you abuse. But it was interesting, you know, it seems to be similar in, in your case too. From, from your position and Lewis McDonald's, Linda Fabiani, that, that you had to congeal around the project and try and take it forward too. Was yeah, it I, I think there was never any doubt in our minds about achieving the objective, building us, uh, being a small part of, of building us uh, astonishing um, building uh, and what it means to the country. Uh, and that was the point, you know, it, and I suppose my reflection now is uh, at least half the parliament were absolutely in favour of it. They were, all bit, they were all a bit quiet about saying that um, and they, because they were just facing public pressure. Uh, and that's just the nature of what it is. But they were super supportive behind the scenes. So we would go back up from a meeting down here with the 
team and and pile into the and this was a good kind of check on what's going on pile into the canteen up the road and to you know for a bite of lunch before the parliament in the afternoon and that kind of thing you'd get it you'd absolutely get it and people would come up and say what's going on there was a lot of interest most of it positive and there were and then the opponents were divided into two categories so there were two or three people that we all remember now no longer sadly with us either who were absolutely against it for, and had good intellectual as they would see it reasons for being against it uh, and and to, to mostly to their credit, it wasn't about personalities or people. It was just about they didn't believe in it. I didn't mind that at all. That was fine. I was less. I had less time for those who, for purely opportunistic reasons, opposed it. And but that's again politics. <laughs> so the, I think we have a, a title is Heroes of the Scottish Parliament, yes. <laughs> and then we have the legacy of the Scottish Parliament. And so I'm just going to. Um, summarise a little, ask you to actually, in terms of the legacy of the Scottish Parliament, if the Parliament building could talk in that debating chamber to the politicians sitting in that debating chamber, what messages do you think the Parliament would give the politicians about what, it's, what it means? I think for me it's, it's uh, please aspire to be as great or as good as the building you're in. Um, every country deserves the best people that can stand and articulate the needs of the country, whether it's about whatever it's about, uh, or, and indeed that country's place in the wider UK and the wider world. Um, but for me, it's about uh, inspiring a quality, of, a quality of candidate, whatever your background or wherever you come from or whatever part of Scotland you come from, who wants to be part of it. And, and architecture inspires that kind of, kind of response. Yeah. Gordon. I find it hard to summarise that. I think it's a very subjective thing about if you give somebody a good building as opposed to working a poor building. And I just hope that you know, the effort that we put into this um, works on some level and it creates better laws and better politicians than if the building had been poor. Subliminal, yeah, I was going to say that, but I couldn't say it. <laughs> so it comes through the psyche of the walls yes. <laughs> and, the, the, and the space. Benedetta. Well, I don't know the message. Uh, it's uh, so many subtle things. Yesterday we had a, a piano concert in the debating chamber. I think it was so beautiful to have music there. It was... Uh, Beauty, let's say, no beauty in uh, in in the sound, the beauty in the vision, uh, beauty also in the, in the space. I think this is always something important for all of us, and makes human beings respond in the best way. So, politicians work in the best, uh, fantastic way. <laughs> and finally, next generation. <laughs> Well, as we say next generation, I was going to say something else there uh, oh, first. No, 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 no. But <laughs> if you say next generation, I think that maybe, so I'll, come on, I'll answer the question. <laughs> but, uh, that's okay. but I say that this building gives a kind of uh, guide or a kind of uh, route for all of us who are practicing or trying to practice to create architecture, to say about try to aim for the highest ideal that you possibly can mm. and, and strive for it. And, and make that uh, effort that you do worth it. And I think that that's one thing that Macintosh embodied and something that Enrique and Benedetta through this project and others uh, embodied as well. And it's so easy in the maelstrom of what we do, this aside from inquiries, uh, to stay focused on that. And I think this building is one of these that really proves why you should always try. That's what I would say. And uh, in a way, in our practice, I think we, we try that as much as we can. Um, the, the, and we look at this building a lot. Um, but in terms of then what can the building say to the politicians? And, and uh, you know, Edward Morgan's po poem is a good place to start. You know, uh, open the doors, light of the day shine in, light of the mind shine out. But aside from anything, I think this building talks on multiple levels. It's symbolic. Uh, very highly charged, a lot of it as well, and it's almost in terms of your point, and uh, whether you know, 
with the intensity of what you see, how can you take it all in? It's almost in a way is try not to force it. You know, just mm -hmm. let you know sit in the amphitheater and enjoy the space, enjoy the moment. I would say, in a way, it's as easy as that. <laughs> maybe, um, but that every time I come here, I look at certain things and see a bit like what Gordy's saying, something ever so slightly different, and see another aspect of something that can become another story. Uh, another something that then says something more than the sum of it being either a light fitting or a piece of wood or media. it doesn't matter and I think that this is incredible so if that can then percolate through to the people who uh, stand for election and work in this building um, and are able to then enjoy it or use it day in day out uh, it's bound to have an effect on it if it doesn't then there's something wrong with them I think <laughs> to, not, not, not to, not to, so, I, it, so it, mu it, it must have, have a, a positive effect. It must, um, it, one way or the other. So thank you. So listen to the voice. Yes. <laughs> so we ran a little over, but we started a bit late. So I'd just like to thank all of the panel members for, for what's been a great chat. I hope you'll agree um, and, and give them a good round of applause. And a special no, and a special thanks to our BSL interpreters who have been working incredibly hard, and and they are Megan, uh, sorry Frick Frickleton and Jenny Laird. So they've done an excellent job for us. <laughs> Uh, and to the parliamentary staff that have guided us um, yeah. and, and looked after us too. Can I say that um, the Festival of Politics continues till Friday. Um, there's an event later on today called Home Sweet Home, which is looking at the housing crisis. So please do, if you can, stay and attend these. There's also one on AI, I think, um, in politics. Um, and there's also... Uh, is it the Parliament 25 years on on Friday as well? So lots to see and hopefully enjoy in this wonderful space. Thank you very much indeed for coming.